Okay, here we're going to go into some of the basics of the periodic table. Now, just looking at this kind of example periodic table in front of us, we see a lot of numbers, a lot of colors, and every number and color has a reason behind it. Look first for a key. In this case, the key would be right here. You can see where the atomic mass is provided to us, the chemical symbol, the name, the electron configuration, the atomic number, oxidation states, so on and so forth for each of the elements. Also see further color coding here to get into some of the families where the noble gases are located here, the metalloids. Uh, so again, everything here is well organized and for a reason. So periodic table, let's break this word down just initially. Periodic means occurring in intervals, and a table is simply a set of data systematically displayed. So why spend time on the periodic table? Well, properties of the elements repeat in a periodic way, and this is a very important tool for chemistry. It also allows us to determine or infer information about elements that we may not know a whole lot about. We know, um, for example, in one particular family how one behaves, we are able to infer how others within that same family behave because of these intervals that occur. Now, periodic table basics. Elements are arranged by atomic number. And a typical box contains here, we're using calcium as an example, the atomic number, which remembers the number of protons, the atomic symbol, C, A, remember it's capital C, lowercase a, that's important. That stands for calcium, which is the element's name, and the atomic mass, which is technically the average atomic mass, which is the reason why this is carried out to a decimal. We see also here our magnesium, Mg is magnesium, we have the atomic number, which is the number of protons, which is 12. The atomic mass, which is protons plus neutrons. So in this case, we know we have 12 protons. Therefore, there must be 12 neutrons. And our oxidation state, which this plus 2 means that we know there's 12 protons. Protons have a positive charge. Electrons have a negative charge. Therefore, there has to be 10 electrons because we have this plus 2 charge. 12 positive charges, 10 negative charges will leave us with a positive 2 as a result. Now, continuing on, our, in our periodic table, the periods are horizontal rows. So row 1, row 2, row 3, row 4, this also could be referred to as period 1, period 2, period 3, and period 4, and so on. It's important to remember period 1 or row 1 contains hydrogen and helium, as we see here and here. So when students go through and they want to count either carbon or nitrogen or oxygen, they'll mistakenly say that's row 1. Remember, this is all row 2. Row 1 is only contains hydrogen and helium. This is all, these elements are part of row 2. Now groups are vertical columns, also potentially referred to as families. And you'll see here these vertical and these, they're colored cell. So this is a group, which is a vertical column, which is also referred to as a family. We see them color coded easily here. Now, there's some interactive periodic tables that provide you the couple links that you're welcome to check out. A lot of great websites to help explain and lay to research certain elements that provide, with a couple, provide you with a couple links here that you can access. Remember, in the description is where you can find links to all the slides. The classification of the elements, there's three basic classifications. There's metals, which is the vast majority of the periodic table here non-metals, which is located in this region, and then metalloids, which kind of have properties sharing kind of both metals and non-metals. So your metalloids are located here, and they separate the non-metals from the metals. Now, the metals in general occupy the left side of the periodic table. They have luster or shiny, basically solids at room temperature except Hg, which is the abbreviation for mercury. Uh, ductile, which is, means the ability to be drawn into wires. As we see here, this is with copper, and malleable, which is ability to be hammered into sheets. They're excellent conductors of heat and electricity, and they tend to form positive ions. So in general, if you're an element that's classified as a metal, odds are you share many of these properties. In contrast, if you're a non-metal, again, located kind of in the region over here on the periodic table, they occupy the right side. They're generally gases or brittle solids. They have a dull looking kind of appearance, and they are poor conductors of heat and electricity. Bromide is the only liquid at room temperature, and they tend to form negative ions. 
So while most of them are located in this region here, I don't want you to forget about this one that's located way over on the far side over there. This is hydrogen. This is also classified as a non-metal. Our metalloids, again, located right here. This would be the yellow uh, elements in this particular periodic table as presented. And just go back for a second. The metalloids kind of share properties that border both metals and non-metals there. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, at least in this lecture, on those. Now, the families of elements. Elements of the same family or group share structural and chemical behavior characteristics. These are the families I'm going to go over. You'll see that they're organized into these nice columns. This large block here is a transition elements, and they're considered the same general family here. So starting with the first one, alkali metals. They're soft, highly reactive metals, usually stored under oil or kerosene to prevent their interaction with air and water. They react vigorously with water. They can produce this potassium, really producing fire when just added to water. Uh, they oxidize readily in the air, and they're good conductors of electricity. It's important to remember that group one is alkali metals, and they often gets confused with the second group. So remember, group one, alkali metals. These alkali metals have one valence electrons. This is a zoom in of those. They will lose an electron very easily, and when electron is lost, the metal gains a stable, non-reactive, noble gas electron configuration. For right now, just note they tend to lose an electron. So lithium tends to have a plus one charge, as does rubidium, as does francium, as does potassium. All these are group one alkali metals. Now group two, alkaline earth metals. An easy way to remember that these are group two is there's two words, alkaline earth, instead of just alkaline metals. These, um, your magnesiums, your strontiums, your calciums are harder, denser, stronger, and at higher melt melting points than those group one alkali metals. They are reactive, but not quite as reactive as group one, and they tend to lose two electrons to gain a more stable electron configuration. Group three through 12 are the transition metals. They're not as reactive as group one and two. Um, huge variety, but all are shiny in nature. They form multiple ions. They also include inner transition elements and rare earth elements. So all of these are generally classified as our transition metals. Continuing on along the periodic table, uh, group 17 down here are the most reactive non-metals. They're called the halogens. They combine easily with metals, especially alkali metals. They have seven valence electrons, one short of a stable octet, and they tend to gain an electron to become stable, so these tend to form this negative one ion. These tend to form a positive one ion, these tend to form a negative one ion. Hydrogen is kind of on, on its own there. It's the most common element in the universe. It's a chemical family by itself because it behaves so differently. It reacts with most other elements, rarely found in the free state in nature, and has one valence electron here, as we see. Now, the Hindenburg is, was filled with hydrogen. It's very reactive with oxygen gas. Uh, helium, not he, helium, is used in blimps today. It's much less reactive than hydrogen uh, to reduce the chance of explosion in fire. Lastly here, just touching on some of the major element families within the periodic table, are the noble gases. Group 18 is all the way on the right-hand side. Uh, they have a very low reactivity. They have a filled valence shell. S and P levels in the highest principal energy level are also full. Very stable electron configuration. As a result, they tend to be used in signs, weather balloons, airships such as blimps, as we see here, a neon sign. Neon is a noble gas as is helium. Xenon lights, typically found in cars, very bright, as a noble gas. It's very low reactivity. We can add electricity to it, and it glows instead of exploding. So hopefully this was a good general overview of the periodic table, so you can develop a better understanding of just why it's organized the way that it is.